baptism of name. The baptism of name is Boniface. Boniface was a Catholic bishop and missionary sent to Germany. He confronted the pagans by cutting a big tree that was used for sacrifice. I want to begin by saying each and everyone has an ecumenical life. Why? On 25th of May, 1975, I was born to a father who was an Anglican. My mother was also converted to Anglicanism, but she had a Salvation Army background. After that, I went to Iten Primary School. By the way, it's called RC, Roman Catholic Iten Primary School. When I commenced my studies there, by then, Father Glory, we used to call him Father Glory. Later I realized he was Father Crowley, or Bishop <laughs> Crowley. He was the parish priest, and he used to come to our primary school, even our standard eight prayer day was crowned by a Catholic priest. Later, in secondary, I went to French school, Kamsinga, which is a French Quaker background. These are people who are Christians, pacifists, and they don't believe in the sacraments. According to them, when the Holy Spirit came, there was no need for sacraments. From there, I went to Kenya Highlands Bible College, a Wesleyan Armenian theological institution that emphasized holiness and entire sanctification. I did my bachelor's degree in Reformed Theological College. These are very closely related to our brothers from AIC here. They believe in Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the state. In my master's level, I went and studied in African Nazarene University, which is also Wesleyan Armenian. And Nika Kundia Jamfi, I completed in Africa. Africa International University, which is evangelical and interdenominational. Each and every one of us has an Episcopal life. We have interacted with people from diverse origins, from diverse Christian traditions, and that is who we are. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you are a moving you are a moving ecumenical movement. As you walk, even if I deny Catholics have a place in my life, therefore we are personally ecumenical because of our history. Number two, we should be ecumenical in our theological formulation. By the way, you can never study systematic theology, or rather you call it dogmatics. You can never engage in dogmatics unless you begin with the foundations that were laid by these great church fathers. We all share Augustine, the bishop of Hippo, great formulator of theology. And I want to say, he was converted, and when he was converted, he had the saying, Tole lege, pick and read. And he read Romans chapter 14, verse, uh, in Romans chapter 14, verse 13, and he was converted. A great theologian, a bishop of the church. We base our theology. We can go up to time, up to the anti Nicene fathers, and look at people like uh, Polycarp. And uh, not only Polycarp, all those apostolic fathers who are proximate. That is the basis of all our theology. We also learn a great deal 
and fundamentally ecumenical theology, whether we like it or not, because we are indebted and we live on the shoulders of our church fathers. The other one is the angelic doctor. The angelic do doctor is Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, it is summa contra gentiles, or summa theology. You know, by the way, the uncaused cause. The unmoved mover. <laughs> the theological argument and the moral argument for the existence of God. We owe it to you, brothers, the Catholics. As we move to the Protestant Reformation. By the way, the title of the book that I've carried here is Theology for the Third Millennium, an ecumenical view by a man by the name of Hans Kuhn. Hans Kuhn is a Catholic like you. In the Middle Ages, we get the theology of the Anglican Church from Thomas Cramer. And by the way, do you know why we moved? Because of personal reasons. <laughs> King Henry wanted a male heir, and the Pope did not budge to allow him to divorce Catherine of Aragon. So, because of a personal reason, number two, it was not only a personal reason, the second reason was uh, a political reason. The people of England wanted to be away from Italy, and, and uh, the third one is an ecclesiastical reason. They wanted to formulate a church. Not distinct. In fact, Henry VIII, who initiated the act of supremacy, died a Catholic. And he was buried by the Catholics. Just like in the college here, they say, I am a Catholic, and I will die a Catholic. It's difficult to change because of the formation and the trainings that you have. John Calvin is a profound theologian. I don't know my brothers from KBC. If you have ever, if you have ever, if you have ever took time to read the Institutes of Christian Religion, there are two volumes, and Calvin wrote them when he was 26 years. Profound, profound, profound. We are indebted to John Calvin. In the modern era, as I conclude this section, we look at people like Hans Kuhn. We look at Karl Rahner. We look at Shelby. I cannot even pronounce the name. <laughs> but a profound theologian. And I want to say, we are ecumenical in theology. John Wesley, as I conclude, he says, in all matters, essential unity. In all matters, non-essential liberty. That's why Galatians chapter 2 verses 20, chapter 3 verses 28 is very profound. That there is no Gentile or Jew. Greek. There are three things that a Jew did not want. They said, I thank God that I was not born a Gentile, a woman, and a slave. Three things they did not want. As Paul, as Paul begins the writing of Galatians, he's very polemical. He's fighting. Who foolish Galatians who bewitched you? That was that's what happened during the Reformation. But at the end of it, he became a renic. Evangelic ecumenical theology is a ready. It seeks understanding rather than judgment. Number two, we are ecumenical not only in theology, we are ecumenical in mission. Do you know, by the way, Patrick was the, among the greatest and the first missionaries. He prayed, God, give me Ireland. And he was a missionary to Ireland. Very valiant mission. You remember Robert Dinobili? 
Robert de Nobili was a great missionary. But Catholic, we learn from him. Samuel Zwema. And also, we had theologians like we had uh, uh, missionaries like William Carr, the father of modern mission, a Protestant. And up to today, we still have missionaries in the Catholic and even in the Anglican and even in African inland church. All of us should be ecumenical in mission. We should learn of the approaches of our father, like Patrick. We should learn of Arnaeus, one of the first missionary to France. And we should incorporate ecumenism as we do mission. Lastly, in our personal formation, in our personal formation, we, in our spirituality, we should learn from the desert fathers. Meditation. As we were walking around the seminary, the serenity is remarkable. By the way, we only stopped to play drafts with one of the fathers, and I told you he's, he clobbered me like nobody's business. <laughs> A father in the making by the name of Moses serves me right. By what we learned in their spiritual formation, silence is critical. One postulant or one college member might make noise sufficient to a hundred fathers. <laughs> I don't want to give names, but you know I'm able to tell you. But one thing that we learned as we walked around, number one, is silence. Number two, humility. Kuosha kwa goma ya <laughs> and the people who are doing that, they have done three years of philosophy. Some of us have not done three months of philosophy. <laughs> but we cannot accept that. Let's learn from them silence. Contemplation. Let's learn. Prudent use of God-given resources. As I conclude, Psalm 133. The Bible says, How pleasant and beautiful is it when brothers dwell together in perfect harmony. In ecumenism, number one, there will be beauty, diversity. We shall be complementing, not competing one another. There are more, more. Sinners outside who need to come to church than there are people in all our churches put together. Our tasks should not be fishing from the basket, but going into the world and make disciples. Let's go out. Let's not poach Christians and we invite more trouble because they are formed differently. Leave them in their formation. Go out and make disciples and let's feed of the Lord. There is beauty in diversity. A body with different parts. It has been my dream to come and speak in the same way. It has been my dream. Thank God today. They believe. <laughs> and like Martin Luther, I can say, I have a dream that one day I'll speak in a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> it came through. <laughs> There is the water that cleanses. The Bible says, like the dew of heaven, it removes all the doubts. Do you see where there is no water, there is always stench. Where there is no water, people will be fault finding and they will be splitting hairs. 
You remember during the time of uh, the medieval scholasticism, they were arguing about how many angels can be at the top of a pin instead of discussing great matters. When there is unity, we shall not be splitting hairs, but we say it, Christ. In Christ, Christianity converges and diverges. Lastly, in ecumenism, there is the oil that lubricates the Christian body of Christ for mission. And there is a oil that removes the stench. Do you know these days as we sit in the afternoon, because of deodorants, you know, these things, videos of deodorants and uh, Oil, there is no stage as people mix. That is what ecumenism does. It removes the stage and the divisions and uh, the sickism and it makes us one. Paul says, I have resolved to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. May the Lord enable us to have a dialogue. May the Lord enable us to pray for one another. May the Lord enable us to have the humility to love for one another. May the Lord bless you. I normally have a YouTube channel, Kimutai Jesus. You can listen to ecumenical sounds. But you can also challenge me just as your captain says. But come up with Kimbia Sana, Makukula Sana, you can also challenge us. We live to be formed by one another. May the Lord be with you. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.